Hi folks, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiator and we're going to look today at the Klingon Batleth and why it's not such a bad weapon as lots of martial artists and fencers have implied. Hi there, I'm your host Matt Easton and as well as being a martial arts instructor for over 20 years, I'm also an antique weapons dealer and researcher so therefore I'm constantly looking at ethnographic and historical weapons from across the world, across time. Now I have noticed that there is a, um, a, a tendency amongst people who are weapon aficionados to be very critical of the Klingon Batleth, of course from the popular franchise Star Trek. Now when I decided to make a video about the Klingon Batleth. I came at it from this point of view as well. However, the more I researched, the more I thought, do you know what? Actually, most of these people are wrong. The Batleth has actually been quite thoughtfully designed, but moreover, it's obviously very iconic and everyone knows what a Batleth looks like, although it can look like various different types, but we'll talk a bit more about that. But perhaps more importantly, a lot of people who know a bit about weapons have been critical of, that, of it, but when you learn more about weapons, you'll see why actually the design of it makes a certain amount of sense. One of the most important things to note is that most people have compared it to swords, and fundamentally it's not really a sword, it's a bladed weapon definitely, but actually it has its best parallels in other weapons that aren't really swords. But before I go on, I want to have a quick word from the awesome sponsors for this video, who are Star Trek Fleet Command, which is an awesome strategy game that you can play on your mobile or cell phone. It's absolutely free to download and play on iOS or Android systems, and you can find the link to download the game right underneath in the description below. In Star Trek Fleet Command, you can engage in a story-driven Star Trek galaxy. It's an awesome strategy game where you can interact with some of your favourite characters from the next generation, the original series, J.J. Abrams' films, Discovery and more. And if you reach level 5, you can unlock a free Origins Burnham. And if you also reach level 10 by February the 10th, 2022, then you'll be given the shards to tear up your Origins Burnham to rank 2. Not only can you choose your own faction, build up your forces and fight the enemy, but you can also engage in the story. So I'm new to the game, but so far I'm really enjoying the kind of building, the space station building and upgrading element of the game, which I always enjoy, uh, enjoyed with old school strategy games. But I also really enjoy the hunting down enemies and destroying them element. And I've got to say, I've been, I've had my ship destroyed a couple of times already and rebuilding it, uh, is, it gives you a, uh, an element of a danger to each encounter. Crush your enemies and defend your allies. I absolutely love that there's so many cool and iconic ships to unlock and so far I've got a lot uh, left to unlock and also of course the characters in there I've already got some of my favourites from the next generation and I'm looking forward to getting some more of my old school favourites and once again thanks a lot to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring the channel and this video so thanks very much for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the Klingon Batleth. So the first thing to say is that this particular weapon was designed by Dan Curry. He was involved in the Star Trek franchise and quite simply took it upon himself to design a character uh, weapon for Worf um, primarily. And uh, what's important to note is that he was a practicing martial artist, as I can understand it, principally in Chinese martial arts. And therefore it should be of no surprise that uh, one of the weapons that he looked at were the so-called Chinese crescent swords. They go by various names. Um, historically, I'm sure they were known uh, by, by different names than that. But that's what they're um, widely known as today. Now they were, despite the fact they're very different to the Klingon Batleth, they do share some characteristics, forward curving crescent blades. And indeed, although they're one-handed and used perhaps as a pair, and the Batleth is a two-handed and one-handed weapon, uh, multi-purpose, um, so it is different, but it is nevertheless inspired by them. But ha perhaps moreover, he was familiar with a whole range of weapons, including many Chinese weapons. Now, we should also mention there are forms of Chinese halberd, which also have forward-curving uh, crescent blades. Now they're usually a pole weapon, usually mounted on a long pole, but nevertheless we can see some parallels here. One of the rather weak criticisms that a lot of people point towards the Batleth is that it doesn't look like any earth weapons that we are, or historical anthropological weapons that we're familiar with. But that's actually a strength, I'll come to that later in the video. But the simple point is that 
This weapon does have characteristics which do share some parallels with real world historical and anthropological weapons. We should also mention the fact that quite simply some cultures have weapons which are pretty much unique to them that they develop and that are very very unlike things that you find in other cultures, sometimes neighbouring cultures. And so they are specific to that group of people. So just because something looks different from the rest of the people doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. In fact, it can be indicative of that particular cultural grouping having a very strong sense of identity. If we look at certain Chinese weapons or certain Indian weapons, and I could refer to lots of other areas as well, but we do find particularly from China and India, we find weapons, types of bladed weapon that you don't really find anywhere else. And so if India hadn't existed, we wouldn't know about those weapons. So I think it's completely valid and correct that a completely signature, a new style of weapon should be invented for the Klingons. So what are the characteristic features of the Klingon Batleth? Well, obviously this varies a slight amount between the different uh, movies, different series, different elements of the franchise. Um, so there are different versions. I think the version that most people are most familiar with is probably from the next generation, the type that Worf has, which essentially has three hand holes, four forwards curving um, horns or spikes, and overall it has a crescent shape, a forward crescent shape, uh, whereby the edges are on the inside on the concave curves rather than on the convex curves. And of course it's got points on the ends as well. And in terms of the size, now this is an interesting thing, certainly in that series we're looking at something that's about 116 centimetres tall, about four foot uh, long. Um, but if you look at other sources it's sometimes described as being five foot long. Now one thing I would say as a weapon user is that I do think that this particular design of weapon would make more sense martially in more contexts if it was more five feet long than four feet long. But of course this can be relative to height and relative to intended usage. So for example if we look at sabres, what's the perfect length for a sabre? Well a cavalry, a cavalry sabre used from horseback is longer than an infantryman's sabre. And an infantryman's sabre is longer than a cutlass or a, a naval sabre. So naval sabres are the shortest on average. Uh, infantry used on foot, uh, sabres are a bit longer than that, and cavalry sabres are usually a bit longer than that. You do find exceptions, sometimes you find longer naval ones, sometimes you find shorter cavalry ones, but that's the general tendency. So quite simply, what we don't know, what we lack about the backleth, is it's quite possible, just as with uh, Japanese katana and tachi and wakizashi, they vary in length because they were made at different times for in, uh, different intended purposes. For someone who's primarily fighting mounted, they'll usually prefer a longer blade, but not always. Sometimes the biggest swords are used by people fighting on foot against particular opponents or against multiple opponents. So some of the biggest European swords are used against multiple opponents or on the tops of galleys of ships for defending uh, against borders or, or indeed to fight against people on horseback. So there's many, many different reasons. So what we fundamentally lack uh, with the making any judgment on the design of the Klingon Batleth is background context and we just have to imagine it. So I think it's completely valid to have a variation of sizes and to some degree a variation of designs and if we look back at earlier Batleth according to the mythology of that particular franchise instead of three holes there's usually either two holes or one hole and additionally in terms of the four forward pointing uh, horns or beaks, blades, um, then they can sometimes be more and they can sometimes be at different different angles and sometimes there's backward facing ones as well. That's absolutely fine. If we look at historical glaives or um, halberds or various types of sword, then indeed we find there's variations in the shape of the blade, the number of points, the number of projections. Completely normal in history. So now we've talked about the size and the shape of the Batleth, what is there to criticise about perhaps the weight of it, the mass? Well, we don't know an awful lot about that, and also mass is very much relevant, uh, relative rather, to the user. So quite simply, uh, you could say that a weapon is overweight for its size, but that might just be relative to you. If a stronger person is using it, or someone with different biology to you, and how much do we really know about Klingon biology? My impression from watching uh, movies and uh, the series is that they probably are on average stronger than humans. So therefore, we would expect the Batleth to be a heavier weapon uh, on average than a, an earth weapon uh, of similar size. 
That being said, there are various points, particularly in the series, but also in the movies as well, where humans either train with or use in combat the Klingon Bakleth, and they're able to do it. Now, if humans are able to pick up one and use one, either in training or in actual combat, that tells us that it's not a particularly impractical weight for its size. But in addition to that, and this now refers to the mass of the weapon, the size of the weapon, the shape of the weapon, again, we don't know about the precise context that this weapon was intended to be used in. It's entirely possible, looking at the way that Klingons dress, that it was designed as a specialised armoured fighting weapon. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, quite simply, if we look at uh, whether it's uh, China or Japan or India or medieval Europe, there are specialised weapons for fighting against uh, armoured opponents and fighting in armour yourself. One of the most famous examples in Europe is the Poleaxe, and the Poleaxe is different to the Halberd. It's shorter, it's got, generally speaking, more projections, has spikes at both ends, this kind of thing. Um, equally, if we look at maces and warhammers and flails and things like this, many of them are designed to overcome armoured opponents. Now, a general tendency for people fighting in armour is to, generally speaking, have weapons that tend to be like short polearm length, which the Batleth is, they are very often two-handed, which the Batleth is, and very often they have multiple projections, in other words, blades or points, which the Batleth does. So it's entirely plausible, in my thinking, that if you wanted to justify, if you need to, the design of the Klingon Batleth, then simply looking at specialised armoured fighting weapons, uh, we find parallels there. For example, in uh, late medieval Europe, we see specialised types of swords designed for fighting in armour, which have pointed crossguards, they have pointed, sometimes spiked pommels, or a pommel that's like a mace. Sometimes the blade isn't edged, it's actually more like a square bar, so you can strike very heavily with it, uh, and also you can grip it, so you can grip the blade in what we call half-sorting. And they tend to have very uh, rigid and thick points for punching through chainmail in the gaps between plate armour. And we know that Klingons wear armour pretty much universally through all of, the, um, all of the different elements of the franchise, the Star Trek franchise, we see Klingons wearing armour. So to my thinking, the Klingon Batleth is an armoured fighting weapon, or at least a weapon that's able to be used against armoured opponents and unarmoured opponents. I'd also just briefly mention, I mean, I touched on the biology of Klingons. We don't know an awful lot about the biology of Klingons, but if we look at our own human ancestors and relatives, for example, we know that the rotator cuff um, was constructed slightly differently in Neanderthals, okay? And I'm not calling Klingons Neanderthals. I don't know if they'd find that insulting or not, or I don't know if Neanderthals would find being likened to Klingons insulting. But the simple fact is, that it affects the tool and weapon technology. So a certain um, group of humanoids might prefer throwing weapons or shooting weapons or certain types of hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons because of their particular biology. Not just in terms of how their arms and bodies function, how their uh, rotator cuffs work, how their elbows are constructed, how their hips work, their mass distribution, are they uh, more heavy in the top of the body or they've got very st strong shorter legs or longer legs. All of these sorts of things make differences. But uh, additionally their psychology and additionally things like their skeletal construction, how dense are their bones, how closely placed are their ribs, how many ribs do they have protecting their internal organs, how much muscle mass do they have. So there are a huge amount of difference in biology that can affect the design of the weapons. So criticising the design of a Klingon Batleth as a human living on Earth now is somewhat ridiculous when you know so little about Klingon biology. So to sum up, I think people that criticise the Klingon Batleth are um, unwise because they haven't looked at the bigger picture. They haven't looked at all of the ethnographic and historical weapons that exist on Earth from our own various cultures and histories. And the simple fact is there is a colossal variation. And there are some weapons that fundamentally are not hugely different to the Klingon Batleth. In fact, as I've said, the Klingon Batleth owes some of its design to Chinese hook swords and indeed other Chinese weapons as well. It has a particular Chinese feel to it, I have to say, as someone who collects and deals in antique weapons. But that being said, it also has parallels with some medieval European weapons and within an armoured context that would make sense as well. Uh, but in addition to that, we have something, we've ended up with something which is very iconic and looks different uh, to anything, to any one particular thing on Earth. Which, of course, if you're designing an alien weapon is completely correct, 
because you have such a different context, you've got a different alien world, you have a different alien species, a different alien biology, you don't know their, their history, what type of armor they wear, how they have to overcome that armor, whether they fight mounted or on foot, or whether they fight in forests or swamps or ice. Uh, different situations can lead to very, very different weapon design. Just look at our own histories here on Earth. So quite simply, I think Dan Curry did actually a fantastic job because you think of sci-fi weapons and the Klingon Batleth is incredibly iconic, much loved by Star Trek fans and has really survived very well actually through the franchises, even when they've changed how species look. The Batleth, for the most part, has remained in people's minds. They know what a Batleth looks like. And as someone who trains martial arts for a couple of decades, more than that, and deals in antique weapons, I think it's a plausible weapon. Could it be made better? Well, I think it's got pretty good hand protection. I think it's got pretty good leverage and reach. It's got pretty good uh, range of options for fighting armoured or unarmoured in different situations. I think it would make a particularly poor weapon as a mounted weapon, I have to say. I think it's particularly a footman's weapon. But if I was to improve the Klingon Batleth, what would I do to it? Well, like I say, I think it's actually got good um, hand protection. I'm not a big fan of the three grip holes. I much prefer the one big grip hole or worst perhaps the two uh, the two divided grip holes because they give a lot more options of where to put your hands on the weapon and anyone who's familiar with using pole weapons or even two-handed swords uh, or axes will know that being able to move your hands up and down is very very useful not all sources do it and for example there's a uh, burgundian pole axe source le jus de la hache which mostly keeps the top hand the right hand in the same place on the pole axe despite the fact that you could move it up and down it doesn't do it very much so it's not a universal, but this is just my opinion. And my opinion is that the three grip holes are too limiting, too restrictive, and more likely to lead to you hurting your own hands, actually. Um, and you could achieve the same hand protection with a bigger grip hole. So that's the first thing I would do. In terms of the blade shapes, um, I would personally prefer the outward spikes to be, instead of forwards, a little bit more uh, straight outwards so you could thrust more effectively with them. Because this is essentially a type of pole weapon. It's a two-handed pole weapon or a double-ended sword, you could say, uh, of sorts. But if they were more, uh, for more sideways projecting, then you could use it more conventionally like a spear or a bayonet. Um, but you could achieve a similar thing by having those double-edged points. Um, so I don't think that's a huge point. Overall, the rest of the shape I don't have a big problem with. Um, but I would change its size slightly. Now, I do understand, as I've said, there are reasons, for example, if you're on board a spaceship or a naval ship or inside rooms or buildings, then sometimes you want a smaller weapon. And that might be a good explanation in uh, Star Trek for why Klingon Batleths are the size that they are. But if you were using them on a battlefield, they would be a more effective weapon, in my opinion, being a two-handed weapon, to be bigger. If they were five or six feet long, they would be very effective pole weapons, I think. So if you had a longer grippable area and the weapon as a whole was five feet long minimum, uh, then I think that that would be an incredibly effective weapon and it would have parallels with lots of the pole arms that were used in medieval and Renaissance Europe. Um, and I think it would be fun to spar with one. I think you'd actually have a reasonable degree of uh, success. And one of the big advantages of that design is the great hand protection. It has to be said a lot of historical pole weapons have that kind of reach, those kind of blades and those kind of options, but they don't have such good hand protection, which is usually made up for by wearing armour, by wearing gauntlets, but nevertheless, having the blade in front of the hands is quite a nice uh, little detail and quite a clever bit of design. So there we go, there's my, not apology for the Klingon Batleth, or rather I feel redressing all of the criticism I have seen over the 20 years or whatever that the internet and discussions about weapons has existed. I think that criticisms of the Batleth are greatly, greatly overstated. And in fact, if we look at the history and the weapons available to us, I think the Klingon Batleth can easily fit within that. And you can easily explain all of the elements of its design purely by context, biology, world building type explanations. I hope this has been interesting and fun to watch. And I hope I'll see you back on the channel again soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.